All right. In this episode, I'm going to pay tribute to Suzanne Summers. As you know, Chrissy from Three's Company, she just lost a longtime battle with breast cancer. And we'll be talking about her for the entire show, so stay tuned. Well, hello once again to the party. It's your host, Frank Weber. I'm so glad that you could join me once again today on this show. Uh, kind of doing something a little bit differently. I actually rearranged my schedule or my plan for shows to come out here pretty soon. I record this on October 16th. So yesterday on the 15th, we got news that Suzanne Summers, who played the beloved Chrissy from the beloved show three's company big, uh, that I'm a big fan of passed away from a long kind of off and on battle with breast cancer. And that was a day before her 77th birthday. So today on October 16th, she would have turned 77, but she was apparently surrounded by family and they are celebrating her life today as we speak. So I am meeting you today with a, a bit of a heavy heart, but we'll try to keep this as lighthearted as possible and discuss a lot of things uh, about her life and career. It was very varied and interesting, to say the least. And I'm a little disappointed in one way because Suzanne didn't really participate, to my knowledge, in any of the Three's Company reunions, which I'm sure there have been several over the years, partly, I guess, because of the dispute that she had over her salary led to a dispute with John Ritter and Joyce DeWitt for a number of years. She made up with both of them, though. I was hoping that everybody who's still alive would be around for the 50th anniversary in 2027 and would have liked to have seen her there. So a lot of you know already that I'm a bit more of a Terry fan, you know, Priscilla Barnes fan who took over permanently for Suzanne Summers in 1981. But they're all family. We all, or a lot of us, let them all into our home for many years. And so they were like family to us. I like Chrissy a lot. I think Suzanne played a tremendous Chrissy. I even asked one time when I was maybe three or four watching the show as it was new with my older half-brother and half-sister and wondering what happened to Chrissy. And I think my older half-brother went into an explanation for it, that she wanted more money and got fired. Uh, has some interesting stories to tell about him, by the way, uh, especially when we watched the old... Bill Bixby, Incredible Hulk. But anyway, don't want to get off on too much of a tangent, but I like Chrissy too. I think she was a unique character. Suzanne played her to a T. The story there was that there was something like 200 girls that tried out for that role in 1976, including Priscilla Barnes. But the role went to Suzanne Summers. She wound up playing largely a ditzy blonde on the show. A lot of lines were especially written for her. An interesting sequence to see her go through those first four or five seasons. Her her hair actually got blonder as it the the series went along. She was beautiful. Um, she embodied jiggly television in several episodes there with TNA and breasts bouncing up and down and everything, which I never thought was sexist like a lot of people think i mean after all john ritter occasionally didn't have a shirt on or his shirt was open or he was in his underwear and 
in one episode, I think they even said a scrotum was showing, but she was a unique character and uh, played that well. I had a great career beyond that show that we'll get into here. So let me go and get into a little bit of a bio here. Uh, she was born October 16th, 1946 in San Bruno, California, San Francisco area. From an Irish family, I believe. She married a guy named Bruce Summers and was married to him for a few years in the 60s. They had a child, Bruce Jr. That was her only child that she had. And then, of course, she met Alan Hamill in 1969. He was a Canadian game show host and also did some commercials, especially out west for an old grocery chain named Skaggs Alpha Beta. Seems like a really nice guy. And so she married him eventually in 1977. And they had been together ever since. Before I get into some of her acting credits, and I'm not entirely certain on the exact timing of this, her biggest break, it seemed, was becoming a semi-regular player on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, doing comedy skits or singing or one of the many different things that she did over the years later on in variety shows, for example. When Johnny... Carson takes notice of you, you, there's a good chance that you're going to become a big star, whether it's in stand-up or acting or whatever, and he did that, and she benefited greatly from that. Was a regular on that show for quite a few years, in fact. She got into acting, had a lot of small roles. There was the scene in Bullet. I think she had already been found dead. She had been strangled in that movie, and in the Magnum Force, she was the topless pool girl, got shot in the middle of the chest, kind of gruesome there. I think it was by Tim Matheson. I'm not 100% on that, but that was the Vigilante Cop movie. And then she was the blonde in the Thunderbird in American Graffiti. Did a number of TV shows other than movies, like Starsky and Hutch was on there two or three times, and Six Million Dollar Man played a villain on that show. Also a love interest of Steve Austin. Was on the first ever episode of The Love Boat. The first ever hour-long episode. And yet never returned to do another spot on that show. And then she spent, as far as air dates go, officially 1977 to 1981 on Three's Company. But by that last season and the salary dispute which I'll get into a little bit later in the show. Uh, I think she wound up having only two full episodes in the fifth season, missed at least one, didn't even show up, and then was brought back for some others where it looked like she was phoning in remotely. Her character was actually from Fresno and had a minister father, if you recall. And then she was eventually fired at the end of that fifth season. And she did a lot of uh, Vegas shows. I think she was doing a lot of them even during Three's Company. And some of them, she tried to do Chrissy and the, the producers and the show owners, of course, of Three's Company didn't like that very much. And she had a hard time getting back into TV and acting. She did have a couple of Playboy pictorials, one of them was some older pics in 1980, and then a new pictorial in 1984. And then she eventually did get back into TV full-time on a TV show called She's the Sheriff, which Priscilla also has a connection to. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. I think those are, those are the two most interesting stories, but that TV series was not a big success. It didn't last more than two seasons. And then she found new stardom in the 90s on a show called Step by Step, which my brother Tom personally hated. I don't know if he still does or not. I watched it once not too long ago. It was okay. But she was on their sort of a Brady Bunch type show where they had children from previous marriages, presumably, and they bonded together as one family. But she was on that show with Patrick Duffy, who had just uh, ended on Dallas. And then Stacey Keenan was one of the children as well. She was on My Two Dads, if you recall. Stacey Keenan, in fact, uh, 
went on to become an assistant district attorney somewhere, which sounds like a really difficult and trying job, especially nowadays. But uh, I kind of thought uh, Suzanne was most beautiful on Step by Step, one of those ladies that got better looking with age, if you will, as far as attractiveness goes. She probably wasn't quite as blonde as the later Chrissy days by then. But in the 90s, of course, I was also when she started doing the Thighmaster commercials. I uh, can't remember what exactly what her saying was on those, but I know Jay Leno and probably some others made jokes about it looked like she was having sex with the Thighmaster or something. We always joke about crazy stuff like that, crazy shit. But uh, that step-by-step -step was on for a while, from like 91 to 98. And after that, she did various things, wrote a lot of books, mostly about alternative uh, diets and health advice. She did write a book of poetry that was somewhat older. She, incidentally, just as me as a dentist, Suzanne was known as not being a big fan of water fluoridation. I can tell you that too much of anything is unhealthy, but, you know, things in the right amounts, like water fluoridation, should be healthy, okay? That's what I've been told and what I've read up on. And then she did a number of other shows, guest spots on talk shows, her own talk show for a little while that Joyce DeWitt visited once in 2012, and they appeared to make up for their... Um, conflicts over the, the years before. I mean, that was at the time over 30 years since Suzanne had left the show. Uh, and of course, you know, she has a lot of uh, family now, extended family. Um, started fighting the breast cancer in the year 2000. And like a lot of times with cancer, sometimes you feel like you have it be and everything is going fine. And and then it comes back and didn't know she had been sick as of late. But uh, that's the news that we got yesterday. And very saddened by it. I like Suzanne a lot. She has a big fan base in general, but also on Three's Company. And like I said, there's different tastes and different preferences about which girl was your favorite. Some people like Janet the most. You know, I like Terry the most. A few people like Cindy, played by Jenna Lee Harrison, and a lot of people like Chrissy. And so this variety is the spice of life, I guess you could say, in that regard. A couple of interesting subjects that I'm going to get into here in just a minute. So I don't think I told this earlier. I don't know how many people knew this or not, and it's not really that important, but she was... The oldest of not just the original trio, but all the roommates. Can't remember exactly how much older she was for John Ritter. Now, if you count Richard Klein, who played Larry, who was not really a roommate, you know, but was a neighbor, uh, Richard Klein's a couple of years older than she is. That's just a little bit of a trivia there. But as far as favorite episodes go, the easiest answer to that would be, as far as acting and stealing the show, would be the show called Chrissy's Hospitality, where she hit her head and had everybody worried that she was dying, especially Jack and Janet on the show. Probably Mr. Furley as well, but she was in the hospital cracking everybody up. It's a very classic episode. It actually came right after the camping episode, Camping We Will Go, which is also great, but she didn't have quite as big a role in that one. And then, of course, another one that I really liked was, I believe was called Handcuffed Together, where Jack and Chrissy are accidentally handcuffed and they have to stay that way for several hours and have a lot of problems and dilemmas of that, including a funny scene at the Regal Beagle trying to negotiate that situation in the the bar there. Uh, and like I said, I think she was very attractive, beautiful. Uh, uh, they had the jiggly TV, especially uh, 
in the original opening when Janet poured water on her and she was in her bathing suit. There was another one where Chrissy and Jack and Larry were in a, I think, a Moroccan restaurant and there was a belly dancer. Actually, Mr. Roper was there too and he was enamored with the belly dancer and she was making some funny moves. And I think at the end of that show was the joke about Jack trying to fix the phone and she said it wasn't for him or something like that. It was really funny and they, she had a lot of specially written lines for her. And then when she had the dispute in season five, a lot of those lines went to either Larry or Mr. Furley. But uh, those were a couple of my very favorite episodes of hers. A lot of great memories. Obviously, the time when she was on the show, her years were a little bit different than Terry's years, just because they were different characters. But I think the times were changing a little bit. I'm always amazed at how the clothing and hair and music styles changed fairly quickly in that show over eight seasons from the late 70s to basically the mid 80s. But then let's go ahead and talk about a couple of things here before we close it up. I always wanted to talk about the contract dispute. If you really want to know things in detail and objectively, there's a great book out there called Come and Knock on Our Door by a guy named Chris Mann. It was published in 1998. It's not in print anymore, but you can occasionally find some copies uh, on Amazon, and I happen to be fortunate enough to have one. But he goes into a great detail about her contract and salary dispute that happened in the 1980 and 81 season. And a lot of the genesis of the problem is that Suzanne wanted to be a superstar from the get-go, whereas John Ritter and Joyce DeWitt, they enjoyed acting, they enjoyed getting recognition for it and appreciation from fans, but they didn't really care too much for the celebrity status. However, Suzanne did. And what was happening at the beginning of the fifth season, I always find this to be kind of hard to comprehend because they were getting, at least the three on the show, were getting paid a lot of money in those days. Joyce and Suzanne had to get paid the same. They had been bumped up to $30,000 an episode in 1980. And then John Ritter was at one fifty thousand an episode with some of the show's profits as well in 1980. So if they're doing 22, usually more like 24, 25 episodes, I mean, they're making the girls anyway, 600 to $700,000 a year from that show easily, which is not chump change. Certainly not then. And it's certainly not chump change. Now, a lot of people would take $30,000 an episode if they could get it, which is basically whatever weeks that they worked. But uh, the thing is, she had uh, apparently fired her agent before this and decided to have her husband, Alan Hamill, negotiate this. And she decided, well, I'm a woman, and this is, you know, a lot of feminist equal rights stuff was going on at the time, and she decided that I would like to get the same thing that John Ritter is getting paid. A noble idea, uh, to say the least, and one that I would support in concept. But there's a lot of complexities and nuances that existed in the business of that show and the contracts there and why it wouldn't have been possible. Uh, John was the, the star of the show and everybody else was supporting actors and actresses is, is one of the things. And so... That was the market issue. There wasn't really an experience issue there. So she and Alan Hamill decided to negotiate for, let's at least get what John Ritter is getting paid, which contractually would have required Joyce to also be bumped up to 150000 plus profits. I don't know how they would have reworked the profits, but when you think about all this, if she had gotten everything that she wanted, they would have been paying three actors probably over a half million dollars per episode uh, for every week they had in a show in 1980. And the show, based on that math, would have been broke pretty quickly. 
And then the other part of it, I think uh, they may have violated some laws of negotiation. Like, for example, when you go and buy a house or even a car, I guess, you can't go in and insult the other party right off the bat because then they'll stop negotiating with you and they'll be annoyed with you. And I think that was a big part of the problem. And um, so there wound up being, because of all this stuff and all this was in the media back then, especially the print and news media, and didn't have any internet or anything, but uh, John Ritter and Joyce DeWitt were a little upset with her because they had this great show going. It was a, a real ratings winner and they were this family and she was disrupting this family and that's what led to the conflict. She was there for the season opener, and I think she didn't show up for the second show, maybe came back for the third, and then the fight was on after that, and she only appeared sporadically in a few remote scenes. She would call Janet usually and talk to her on the phone, and they actually brought her to a separate door through the studio and shot her scene there, and that was pretty rough. I mean, I have to admit that was pretty rough to have to do that, and be separated from the people that you have been working with for several years already. But then they eventually fired her at the end of that season five in the spring of 1981. And they had already hired, of course, Jenna Lee to play her cousin, Cindy Snow. And of course, Priscilla was going to be Terry in the fall of 1981, her permanent replacement. Have to note, of course, uh, regardless of who you think was right or wrong on that situation, all the women, all the young women, except for Jenna Lee Harrison, had problems with the producers there. And Priscilla's are very much noted. I mean, she said that Three's Company was the worst three years of her life because of the producers, but not because of the friendships that she made with the other actors. But that was Suzanne's story that with the dispute there, in case you didn't know about it. Um, not only is that detailed in the book that I discussed, but there's a lot of specials about that. Uh, there was even a a show, like in 2003 or something, that was on NBC that had other actors playing the actors and talking about this. There was also a story in the fall of 1983 or thereabouts. I don't know how substantiated it was, but Three's Company was going to end and be transformed into Three's a Crowd, its spinoff, where Jack had a love interest that he was going to live with. And supposedly Suzanne and her husband, Alan, lobbied the producers, probably indirectly through the media, for Suzanne to come back as Chrissy and play Jack's love interest on the show. That didn't work out because of the previous conflict. But the role eventually went to Mary Cataret, who played Vicky on that show for its one season in 1984-85. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if that had actually been the case and Chrissy had come back as his love interest. Some people think that Janet should have been his love interest. But uh, there was a bit of a, a wrangling that went on uh, over that at the time. The other story is that when Suzanne came back into sitcoms, it was on this syndicated show called She's the Sheriff that lasted about two seasons. And I had heard on, Priscilla actually had a podcast in 2017, wound up doing only about 10 or 12 episodes, but then she started talking about, she and Joyce actually uh, was on the show, it was the 40th anniversary talking about that at the time and uh they had sort of in a backdoor sort of way let suzanne back into uh sitcoms through the show she's the sheriff i don't know what joyce had exactly to do with it but that show was originally set for priscilla to play sheriff hilde granger which was kind of a weird premise the uh the sheriff's widow was to take over the sheriff's job, even if she maybe hadn't had any law enforcement training. 
or whatever. Kind of a weak premise, but uh, Priscilla shot the pilot, which we can't find anywhere now. has probably never been released. But she, PB, as we affectionately call her, left that show because the guy who created it apparently was sexually harassing her. Wanted to go to bed with her, even though he already had a family, is what she said on the podcast. But they wound up going out and getting Suzanne Summers, and she wound up getting back into sitcoms because of that. I'm glad that she came back. Even though that show wasn't successful, there were some other things that she wound up doing later, such as Step by Step, Thigh Master, and all sorts of other shows of that nature. Obviously, She's a Sheriff was not well remembered in sitcom history by any means, so if you don't remember it, you're definitely not alone. And one other important thing I should tell you, I was always kind of puzzled by this, but Priscilla has never met, at least as of six months ago, had never met Suzanne Summers, and I don't know if anything has changed after over 40 years. She said that on a radio show slash podcast, one of the radio stations in Los Angeles that does a retro show, uh, was doing one on Three's Company back in the spring, she said that. However, Suzanne had met Jenna Lee Harrison once because Jenna Lee, along with Don Knotts, in fact, played Mr. Furley and the Three's Company, had been cast to do a sort of a backdoor pilot from She's the Sheriff. And there are a couple of different stories about what actually went down between them. Suzanne may have been somewhat bitter about the women that replaced her and so when she met Jenna Lee, one account such as in Come and Knock on Your Door suggests that she gave Jenna Lee a hug and said, oh, don't worry about it, nothing's wrong or whatever. But then Jenna Lee had said that, well, it was a little weird between us. We exchanged a couple of pleasant words and that she had called her cousin because Cindy Snow, which was Jenna Lee's character, played Chrissy's cousin on Three's company. That was the story, and I don't know if anything would have changed if Suzanne had hung around a little bit longer and if we had seen her at that 50th anniversary, which is what I would have liked to have seen her at. But that's going to be a little bit different, you know, watching the old reruns now. And the last thing that I'll tell you that I need to mention here before I go is that she had that real snorty, she created that snorty laugh that Chrissy sometimes did on the show on Three's Company. I don't think I could recreate it here, but I don't know if it was like ho, 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 or something like that. It's not like that at all. It's the, the air is going the other direction from what I just did there, but I know that was a terrible recreation. Uh, probably should give me a little slap on the wrist for that, but that was also what one of the things Chrissy was known for on uh, Three's Company. I just wanted to pay tribute to Suzanne today, and hopefully that was a pretty good tribute. I know her priorities were a little bit different than John Ritter and Joyce DeWitt, whom she apparently did make up with. She made up with John in 2003, shortly before he died. Made up with Joyce on Suzanne's internet show in 2012. Although, watching that, I don't think she and Joyce were ever friends. The way Joyce and Priscilla are friends, and even a couple of years after that, Joyce was still saying that um, Suzanne was misrepresenting the situation there that occurred with her contract dispute. But it's always sad to see somebody go, like I said, especially in the days when there was only three TV channels, you know, invited lots of different people, individuals, and families into your house and let them entertain you for a little while. And that's what she did, and really sad to see her go, sad that she's passed away, and hope you enjoy this little tribute to her. I wanted it to be a little bit more humorous than it was, but it's kind of hard to do that sometimes. But uh, rest in peace, Suzanne. We love you, and we'll continue to watch you on Three's Company and your other shows. So uh, thank you once again for being with me on this episode of Frank Weber's Party. I uh, look forward to bringing you a lot more. Please be sure to tell your friends and family about me. Hit subscribe. And leave me a note. Send me an email. Send me a question, however you'd like to communicate with me. 
And for now, this is Frank Weber signing off. The theme song is called Retro Funk. And it's by Soul Prod Music. And it can be found at pixabay.com. <laughs> <laughs>